Thank you very much, Patrick. Good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for coming out this evening. Virtual audience, thank you very much for joining us. The parking and the traffic are just terrible, aren't they? Did anybody try to go down Scottsdale Road? They've completely ruined it from Lincoln Drive to Jackrabbit, I think. Well, not a problem for you because you're already here. But um, anyway, um, I appreciate your slogging your way through, and I'm delighted to have Tess back. We've been together, good Lord, how long is it? Since Harvest, 1996. So, there we go. And Tess, as you know, has written many different kinds of books. She's, Rizzoli and Isle might be the one that you know the best, but she's written books based on her musical background. This is the start of a new series, and then you may not know that Tess, who is a physician, actually started by writing romance. Oh, right. I've done pretty much everything you except have. except sports. <laughs> you could work that in, I'm sure. Right. And then do we want to go back and mention your sort of science fiction book, or is that such a sore point you'd rather pass Oh, over? no, I'm happy to talk about science fiction as well. Uh, I did one science fiction book. I've done, as she said, romantic suspense. I've done medical thrillers. I have done historicals. Um, and now, now we're doing espionage. We are. Um, and I really love this. Now, interestingly enough, we did a program with David Baldacci. And were any of you here for that? Right. So it's, it's so curious that sometimes writers land on kind of the same things at the same time. So David has set a book in coastal Maine where a spy is killed or some sort of shady action is going on. It's a small town. There are secrets. Um, and there's um, a kind of an ex-spy sent to figure out what happened. So how would you quickly sum up the spy, the spy coast? <laughs> Sounds awfully close. It really does. <laughs> but no, the spy coast is really based on my hometown. Um, it's, uh, you know, I moved to Maine about 33 years ago. And my husband is a medical doctor. He, had, he opened up a new medical practice. And when he got new patients, he would ask them their occupational history. And he started hearing this answer way too often. <laughs> I used to work for the government. What did you do for the government? Oh, I can't talk about it. And when he heard that a couple times, um, I think we were both really quite puzzled about what was going on. And it was a, it was a real estate agent who told us they're all retired CIA. So um, I'm, there are probably a lot in Phoenix as well. <laughs> they, Actually, there's a big FBI. There's a retired, because I used to go and do talks for them. They have a, a whole kind of FBI conference here. And then if you believe C.J. Box, the LAPD all retire and go to Idaho. That's right. Because, that's right. Um, his, his Edgar winning book, what's it called? Blue Heaven, I think yeah. it is. Blue something. Anyway, it was based on the fact that this whole community in Idaho was all retired LAPD. Yeah, well, I found out we had a lot of retired. Retired CIA up in where my little town. I only live. It's only 5,000 people where I live, um, and I discovered that on my short little street that I was living on at the time, um, I had a retired spy on either side of me. <laughs> well, one was OSS, so we're going way, way back. Um, and then my son's um, good friend. I was talking to his the son's the the young the boy's father on the phone, and something he said made me laugh. And I said, "Oh, you must be CIA." And there was a very long pause. <laughs> and he said, who have you been talking to? Hmm. So I found out later that both he and his wife were married spies during the Vietnam era. So, and then the last couple of months, I've been you know, invited out to dinner. And I found out that every single table I had been at, there was either a retired CIA person or a retired spies child at that table. So, um, yeah, I, I couldn't figure out why they were all settling in Maine and... Um, Asked a lot of questions, and I've heard a lot of explanations. One of them is that Maine used to be considered a place for safe houses, so whenever they wanted somebody to hide away for a while, they'd just send them up to Maine. Wait, I've, let me intrude something. Yeah. Maine is a border state, and therefore, if you had a safe house and you really needed to get somebody like quickly out of the country, you could just hop over the border into Canada. Yeah, we it's real easy. We don't to think of our <laughs> northern border nearly as much as we think of our southern border, but, you know, I mean, you could actually swim for Canada if oh, you had to. There's a lot of great places in Canada to hang out, too. Mm -hmm. um, and then I've also heard that um, 
it uh, it's partly because in New England we don't we we're not really nosy people. We let you have your privacy, so spies can feel comfortable there. Um, it's far from any nuclear targets, and um, we also had a new <laughs> a branch of. MK Ultra was working uh, in the mid-coast during the late 60s and early 70s, so a lot of spies probably showed up there. Um, somebody who was, who was in touch with the whole lore said she was told that the really worst spies ended up in Bethesda, retired in Bethesda, the middling spies went to Florida, and the cream of the crop came to Maine. So, <laughs> so somehow we got the best spies. I love it. So any of you read the Thursday Murder Club? or read the Richard Osman, or Deanna Rayburn's book, you know, Killers of a Certain Age. So I'm happy to say that, since I am one, um, that senior sleuths have sort of come back. Um, any of you remember Mrs. Polifax, Dorothy Goldman's wonderful spy at all? How I, I really miss Mrs. Polifax. And so Maggie, Maggie Bird could be well called senior, could she not? Yeah, she's in her 60s. Um, and I couldn't have written this book if I hadn't, if I was not my age. I mean, I couldn't have written this book 30 years ago. But one thing I notice, and those of us who are of a certain age, as we get older, we sort of start getting ignored by people. I think young people think we've lost it, right? They think, oh, well, she's just retired. What does she know? Um, they don't really stop to think about our lives before we retired. Maybe we were, you know, we have some skills that they would be impressed by if they knew about it. So um, I think it was that feeling of, of becoming invisible that bothered me. And that's what I wanted to write about is older people who have incredible skills but have become invisible. Um, so it's it's a little bit of a a, a cry against uh, against the way we are perceived in a lot of ways, especially on American television. You don't see many old faces on American TV anymore. Very true. So do you think that's a harder problem for women, just to be sexist here? But um, definitely, do you think that men turn as invisible. I can remember very very clearly. My younger daughter is really very pretty, and for many years I would go to New York and I would walk around and. You know, all the glances were for me. And then I took Susan to New York when she was 17 or 18, and I realized walking down the street that I could just be a pane of glass because nobody saw me. They saw Susan, you know. But And I thought, wow, is that really what it's like? And, and that's what makes you a great spy at this age, right? I mean, as, this, as, as Maggie thinks, uh, the best disguise is, is gray hair. Hmm, interesting point. The, really, the CIA should be using a lot more people over 60. <laughs> so from what you've already said, the fact that there are numerous retired spies in Maine, if Maggie Bird is under some sort of a threat, there must be a spy network she could tap into. Yes. This is the fun part about it because I got to thinking about all my neighbors who are retired from the agency. What are their lives like? You know, do they have cocktail parties? Do they have book groups? Do they do what you and I do? I mean, it occurred to me that as I was meeting them in the, uh, you know, maybe to my um, ignorance, that I was rubbing shoulders with these retired spies in the post office, in the grocery store. And I just wondered, you know, they look ordinary, but what are their lives really like? And so I imagine they probably get together and they can talk to each other. They can't talk to everybody else, but they can talk more to each other. Um, and that's where I came up with her friends. <laughs> she has four friends. Um, they all know each other from training, uh, you know, many years before. They trust each other. They've all kind of migrated to Maine because one liked it and told his friends and the others came up afterwards. So um, this is kind of her support group. They're, this is, they call themselves a reading a, you know, a book group, but what they really do, and I don't know of how many other book groups do this, they really go there to drink and gossip. <laughs> Sometimes the book gets forgotten. Um, so that's, that's what uh, they call the Martini Club. So what's not to love about that, right? Seniors, book clubs, I mean, it's just irresistible, right? You can have a bookish spy mystery, but what a great cover for a group. So we're in a town called Purity, Maine. I love the fact. Why did you pick the name? Purity felt to me like an innocent, safe place. And that's, I think, part of the reason that this group of spies chose to, to live there is because it felt like a safe and pure place. You know, um, having been in Maine for 33 years, I really do feel it, there's a lot of innocence there still. I really feel it is a safe place. I mean, I, I've 
wouldn't live anywhere else. And I've lived at some great places. And, you know, I've lived in San Diego and San Francisco and Honolulu, but there's something about Maine that still feels um, untouched. And, well, until until Lewiston. That it's was colder. A, yeah, it gets colder. And that that's probably why the Lewiston shootings were um, such a shock to Mainers. Mm -hmm. Um, but anyway, that's that's a, a, what I love about the place. It's also a place where you could hang out if there were if war broke out in the world. It seems like a safe place to be. So something does actually break out in in Maggie Bird's life in Purity, Maine. Yeah, um, Maggie comes home from a a, a book group party <laughs> to find a dead body on her driveway, um, and she recognizes this woman. This woman had paid her a visit earlier that day, um, and Maggie thinks this body is here for a reason. It's here to warn me. It's here to scare me. It's a message from my past, because the reason Maggie left the CIA was her very last operation was a disaster. She um, and she's still she's still grieving about what happened. She's still haunted by it. That's what I that was my first feeling about Maggie Bird when I created this character is I knew she was haunted, but I didn't know why. Um, and this is where she comes face to face with kind of a, a mini nemesis, and that is a local police officer. Um, her name is Joe Thibodeau. She is uh, in her 30s. She's the acting police chief. She is a Mainer through and through. She's been in Maine for generations. She wants to protect her town. And here is this strange 60-plus-year-old grandma type with a dead body in her driveway. And Joe cannot figure out why this woman seems so calm. She can't figure out why the woman is not in hysterics. Um, she wonders who Maggie Bird really is. And then she really wonders when she notices that there is a surveillance camera over the porch. She asks Maggie, can I, can I see your video? And Maggie very reluctantly has to open up her, her computer to show her the camera feed. Now, the cops are expecting like a ring camera, right? Well, there's like a 16-channel thing on, on, her, on her computer with every single part of the farm under surveillance. And now is when the cops are thinking, who is this woman? And why is she so security conscious? So that sets up one of the, one of the fun conflicts is... This young woman versus this older woman, this local versus this woman from away, um, will they ever become friends? Will they ever become allies? And that, that's kind of a theme that's going to be running through the series, I think. Well, um, also, so Maggie actually has now two fronts she has to work on. She has, you know, who's the woman in the driveway and why is that a threat? But she also doesn't want to out all of them to the local policewoman. She can't say, well, you know, we're all spies of the Martini Club. So she has to rally the Martini Club to help deal with the police chief on the one, or the acting police chief on the one hand, who's really a determined woman. Yeah, she's a determined woman. And that's why I kind of love Joe. Um, Joe reminds me of a lot of solid, real Mainers. Um, you know, they're, they just they just are salt of the earth and they will, they're bulldogs. As Maggie says, she may not outsmart us, but she can outlast us. And <laughs> that's, that's Joe. So that's the setup. And that's probably all we want to tell you about how the story goes, because it's really fun. Um, and I was very happy to hear Tess say that when she finished it, she wasn't done with the characters and therefore she would be writing at least one more book about these people. So that is a spoiler. You will work out that Maggie at least survives, right? But um, sorry about that. But <laughs> you know, if it were a true standalone, right. you know, there's no safety net for anybody. Oh, yeah, well, I would never kill her. That. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. Right. So what else is going on in your crime writing life? Are you doing anything besides Maggie? Um, well, um, well, the big news is that Amazon Studios has picked it up for television. Um, so we're just, I'm, I'm meeting with them uh, day after tomorrow in L.A. So let's hope it does become a television series. Um, they were interested because they felt that they had a lot of male, you know, masculine-centered thriller series now um, on television. And they, they don't really have that many where women are concerned, especially older women. I just you just don't see them. But you know, there are a lot of older actors. Actors notice I say yeah, who need actresses, jobs to use the current <laughs> lingo. But um there was a time when you would have had a real problem casting somebody like Maggie Bird, but now, you know, there are a whole bunch of women in yeah. um at least over fifty, but in their say I mean, how old's Helen Mirren now? Does anybody know? She's okay. probably a little too old for this role. No, or Judy Dent no, I'm just speculating <laughs> on older uh, Judy Dench's yeah. Yeah, I mean, there yeah. are a lot of them out there. Um, what's her name that's so good in Downton Abbey? Um, 
can't think of her name. Oh, Maggie. She's Maggie. got to be in her 80s Maggie's or something been, oh, like yeah, that. Oh, yeah, she's she pretty might, old. She might even she's be as old, old as I am, which is hard to believe. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think I think that it is a time when you could reasonably expect to do a good casting job right. with this book, and you wouldn't have to, like, make her 45. No, Which no. would sort of kill the whole point. It would kill the whole point. The trouble is that... An actress in at who, it's who's sixty right now probably looks forty five. So <laughs> you have to go older to get them to actually look like a normal sixty year old woman. But there's no reason that Maggie can't look good for her age. <laughs> I mean, come on, <laughs> that's okay. You know, she could be visiting a spa somewhere down in Camden. That's or true. there is romance you know. in the book. There. <laughs> yeah. No. 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 I don't think. I don't think Maggie has to be past it. What did I read about the French actress Sarah Bernhardt? said with some pride that she took her last lover at age 67 and some of us were going only 67? I, yeah, I know. That <laughs> seems mean, awfully young. Really? <laughs> you know. Well, part of the fun also was was revisiting a lot of the places in the world that I love. This story hops around from Bangkok to Istanbul to London um, to Milan um, and and ends up in Malta and, and, and uh, one of the uh, one of the pivotal scenes. Right. And those are all places that I never really thought I was going to use in a story, um, but they ended up in here. Oh, they wouldn't so. work in Rosoli and Isles particularly. No, well. no, no, they wouldn't no. work in Rosoli and Isles, but it was fun to go back in my memory at least. And just, you know, when, when, when I write about a, another town, um, it's really the smells I remember. Um, yeah. how I was feeling at the time. I mean, I remember being so horribly jet lagged in ba Bangkok. And so my poor, my poor three agents who end up in Bangkok after a hot day, they have to go take a nap. <laughs> so mm. that's, that's what I remember. The smells, the food, and there's a lot of food in here as well. Yes, there is, which is wonderful. So the reason she's touring all around is an urge for Maggie to figure out what's happening. We have to go back into her past to see, you know, how she got there, which... I think it's always a fun thing to do. It gives you a chance to show us, as you say, m numerous places, but also um, some history along the way. I mean, one of your musical, the one about the violinist, you know, you had tons of history in it. In fact, I'm trying to remember, was it purely, one of them was purely historical, wasn't it? Uh, oh, bar, bo no, actually, both of, both Bone Garden and um, and Playing With Fire had a little had a little bit of present day as well. Um, it was back were, and forth. Yeah. yeah, they were back and yeah. forth. But So you've always liked, you know, like, well, not always, but you have liked doing that in other books. I like it because I think it gives you some perspective. With, with, with the Bone Garden, I was trying to go through medical history and going through the history of childbed fever. And I needed to show the audience what this actually, what, what is, what is the significance of what Oliver Wendell Holmes discovered in the 1850s, 1840s. And you don't know that until you come into the present and look back and think, oh my gosh, they never washed their hands. And now we know why Oliver Wendell Holmes was, was doing all this research. So it needed that present day perspective. Um, and with, um, with playing with fire, I wanted to show the present day because I wanted you to know what did happen to that music and what did happen to um, to the main characters during the Holocaust. So um, Tess has embarked on a new publisher, a new publishing venture, and by not entirely by coincidence, we have another author here who has similarly done that. So JT, come on up. I'm going to swap with you. This is Yay. my friend JT Ellison, who many of you may know as Thriller Chick. Here, you, you sit there. I'll yeah. JT, JT and I go, I'm trying to remember how far back we go. Do you, but really it's been... wanna, do you want to know how far back? Do you remember? Oh, do I remember? Go ahead. Do you want to hear the story of how I met sure. Tess Gerritsen? Um, we were here in, in Scottsdale. We were at the Biltmore. And we were oh checking, in, we were checking right. in for Thriller Fest. That's thrill, the first Thriller Fest. The very fest. first Thriller Fest. And I saw Tess Gerritsen across the room. And I literally, I was talking to Alison Brennan at the time, who I had now met for all of two minutes. And then I see Tess across the room and I charged across the room with my hand out, which she had to take or else I was going to stab her in the stomach with it. And I said, Tess, you're my biggest fan. <laughs> that was really embarrassing. It was mortifying. I'm still mortified. I have been right. mortified my entire life. And you were so gracious about it. And you were like, oh, thank you. <laughs> it was really. So, so yes, I do. I remember the moment we met. Um, and then we've done a number of things together yeah. over the years. Yeah. And, and it's, I'm a huge fan. I'm so now, fan. now we're sisters in, in another way now as well. Now we're sisters in another yeah. way. And, and yeah. I, I, I was telling Tess earlier when I saw 
her deal that was the tipping point for me. I was like, yep, I'm going to. Let's do it. Let's do it <laughs> so together. We're, we're both being published by Thomas and Mercer, which mm -hmm. is a part of Amazon. And, you know, this is something that I never imagined I would be doing 10 years ago. Uh, and I want to thank Barbara for being so supportive of mm -hmm. all authors, no matter who their publisher is. Yeah. Um, Barbara has always been open-minded and... Um, I don't regard Amazon as the enemy. Actually, in many ways, they're the best, best publisher around at the moment, truly. Yeah, but, um, but in a terms lot of, of how they operate, I know a lot yeah. of a lot of people have a misconception about what's actually going on. But um, my my general approach has been: if this is an author that I supported before, if they have decided to change publishers, it's not any different than if you suddenly signed up at Simon & Schuster or something. Mm -hmm. um, as long as the, as the publisher does a good job. I'm very fond of your overall publisher, Gracie Doyle, who wanted to be here tonight, but her mom had surgery. Um, I think it was really Robert Dagoni who, you know, I more or less carried him to, to Amazon when his other publishers uh, kind of went away, and that's how I got familiar with it. And then we had um, one of our editors at Poison Pen Press is now a senior editor at Amazon. Um, so, you know, been lots of things. But, you know, my standard is, are you, are you writing wonderful books? And where they come from doesn't really matter. Um, same price, you know, that you, actually, they don't charge as much. Their books are less expensive right now. So you guys get to save a couple of dollars when you come down here to an Amazon. Um, but anyway, JT, so what is it that you have done? We know what Tessa's done. She's writing two books now at least. But what are you doing? So I am writing um, standalone thrillers. And my new one is called A Very Bad Thing. It'll be out in September of next year. Um, and I also write a CIA librarian series. Jane, Joss, Joss, here, I have it Joss right Walker. here. Joss, well, I love the idea of a CIA librarian. You will <laughs> gather that this is fantasy. There is magic in it. And one of the things I particularly love, when I was getting my library degree, I had to spend um, time at Vanderbilt University in Nashville. And where is it that Jane Thorne is actually working when this thing opens? She is working at Vanderbilt University yep. in the library. Okay. So here it is. This is book three. Um, books one and two are out in paperback and in hardcover. Um, this one is the new one. And you have a fourth one coming when? The 28th of November. Oh, wow. Yep. Coming right up. Coming right up. Yep. So I love them. I mean, you know, we have spy, we have fantasy, we have magic, we have some romance. And once again, we have a woman who's the lead character. They are so much fun. It is. And, and Tess, I want you to answer this, too, because I think it's important to what you're doing with this and what I'm trying to do with, with Jane. Police procedural is very reactive. It, Joe has this problem in this book. It, she is a reactive force, right? She can't be proactive. She has to wait for the crime to be committed to get involved. And Maggie's quite the opposite. She can get involved and oftentimes creates the problem or the solution before the police ever get involved. And so that's the very much the CIA versus the police. Do you, which do you find and how fun was it to write that? juxtaposition of reactive and proactive. Well, I <laughs> I loved Ma writing about Maggie because when we talk about espionage, it's really, I mean, they, they have a mission and the mission isn't to react. The mission is to try and prevent things from happening. I mean, they are out there trying to protect the country uh, or trying to enact, you know, change in a, in a, positive direction that is from our point of view anyway uh the police and you're absolutely right the police just wait for something bad to happen well let's talk about i mean not to dwell on it because it's so tragic but let's talk about lewiston in maine yeah. yes. there were plenty of warning that this guy you know was um going going bad yeah. um and the police could not there was no actual cause for arrest the army sent him in for you know an exam and that didn't work out. His family said, you know, we're, he's unstable and what's going on here. But until he actually killed all those people, the police could not do anything. So they are indeed reactive. Just think if, you know, they'd been able to put him into some kind of preventive custody. I mean, but then many? everybody would have screamed about his civil rights and, you know, on and on and on. Part of it is that our mental health care system sucks. Um, and so that, that happens. But, you know, the, you're right. The police are always like a beat behind the action mm -hmm. intentionally. I mean, 
in order to preserve other liberties, but it's tragic when they can't prevent something. Well, I, I think the tragedy is it would have been if only they had taken away his guns. I mean, yeah, uh, yeah, he needs mental health, but um, Maine is a very pro-gun state, um, you know, and even though if you look at the, if you, if you poll everybody in the state of Maine, I'm, I'm, I have a feeling the majority would still want stricter gun control. It's just that we can't get it. And, um, they could just take away the AR-15s and the actual rapid oh, fire. Yeah. You know, it's a <laughs> lot know. harder to do damage with a single, you know, with a pistol than right. it is with a, you know. But anyway, I didn't mean it to wander into gun law and politics and all, but it was just a great illustration of what you were talking about, yeah. that that tragedy unfolded because the police were, you know, reactive and not proactive. Right. And they, they don't have a choice. I mean, they, they can't. They can't do things ahead of time. And that's that's really frustrating for me. It's frustrating for me as a writer. It's frustrating for me as a person, but it's frustrating as a writer that, you know, I have to wait for something to happen to be able to write about it. So I like being able to create a situation yeah. to, to prevent, to save people before, you know, it's the difference between the thriller and the mystery, right? I think you're the one that actually explained that to me the first time. The difference between a thriller and a mystery, you know, the thriller starts... Um, the week before September 11th. Yeah. And yeah. we know who the players are and we know that they're trying to take down the building. And can you stop them? Can you stop them? Versus the mystery starts after the building comes down and then you have to figure out who did it. So that's, I mean, it's just a really quick, easy delineation. And then even within the thriller, then it's, you know, proactive or reactive. <laughs> right. Right. So to have these two, these two aspects, I mean, them fighting with each other and, and also trying to cooperate with each other is interesting. Yeah, yeah. it really was. I, I like that. What's the favorite, what's your favorite part of writing? Uh, the end. <laughs> I, I think that my favorite part is the very beginning when it, when it's just a gleam in your eye, it's kind of, well, I don't want to compare it to sex, but the best part, right, is conception. <laughs> because after that, it's hard work. It's um, nine months or a year of, of, you know, you have this, this glimmer in your eye, about what this baby is going to look like, you think it's going to be the most beautiful, most intelligent, most brilliant, amazing child. And, but then you have to gestate it. <laughs> And um, I think that was um, that's the best part is just the very beginning of it when it, it when you don't see the flaws yet. And your gestation is quite loose, correct? <laughs> well, you know, I don't. And we both neither of us. Well, it, it's changed now, but <laughs> yeah, neither of us used to outline. I still don't outline. And that's why. Um, I am always writing myself into blind corners. I don't know what the story's going. I don't know what this character really wants. Um, and it's after I finish the first draft, a very, very painful first draft, that I think, oh, now I know what the story is about. And the, I think the real writing for me comes in the second draft. I, I say that. I can't tell how many people they're like, can we see the first 20,000 words? I'm like, well, you can see them. I can't yeah. guarantee that they will still be there or that they will be in that order. Yeah, you can't. I can't see the story until it's done. Right. And I never show anybody my drafts because I would be so embarrassed. I heard her. I heard her was this wonderful term for that first draft. Um, I can't remember who it was who said it. She calls it her puke draft. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that was that was that was about it. Yeah, that yeah. is about it. So that writing style is really more about rewriting, isn't it? You get the first draft out, you say, okay, this is what, what the story, the bones of the story should be. But then the book really is in, lies in the rewrites, yeah. the revisions. Yeah, and, and that's actually when, probably when I feel really, really depressed is when I see that first draft. And I think, oh my gosh, how am I going to fix this? Um, because then I think it's just a piece of, you know... <laughs> bad <laughs> it's a bad thing um and but it's maybe about the third draft that it starts to feel like a book and then i still go i still have three more drafts after that i usually go about seven drafts did you go back and forth in time in the drafting of this or did you come back and layer in the past to to answer the present yeah you know you in in other books i have i have just done the past and then i've done the present and then i would layer them in this one it felt really natural to just suddenly stop during the, the contemporary story and thought, okay, now I need to do some backstory. So I think I was doing that in the very first draft because a lot happens um, in Maggie's past. Um, we find out why she's such a sad woman and what she's running away from. And I don't want to give it all to you at once. It's, it's kind of weaves into, the, um, into what's happening in the present day.
works perfectly. So if you're going to write a sequel, and you've already told us all of this mm -hmm. about Maggie, um, how do you envision a story shaping up for book two, uh, is there more of Maggie's past you can go investigate, or are you no. kind of done with that, and you're just going forward? The book the, the book I'm working on now is very local. It's very much focused um, on the little town of Purity in Maine, um, and it starts off with, it's called the Summer Guests, and it's about, you know, we have a big summer population. They come, and our population swells to 20,000, and then by the fall, they all go home to Boston and New York. Um, so it's about some su a summer family that comes and their teenage girl goes missing in this family and they don't know what happened to her. And so they drag the lake thinking maybe she drowned and they find another body in the lake that appears to have been there for decades. Um, all these two things connected. Um, but it really goes, uh, I really bring in some of the CIA past um, in this little town. I don't know how many of you are familiar with um, Project MK Ultra. It happened in the late 60s to early 70s. The CIA was actually doing this around the world, but we had a little outpost of it right in my town. Uh, I can even tell you which house it was happening in. Um, the FBI, I mean the FBI, the CIA was looking into pharmaceuticals that might help them um, try to get confessions out of foreign agents. And so they were, they were feeding people LSD. They weren't always telling them that they were getting LSD. And there, were, there was at least one death of, a, of a, a CIA agent who jumped out a window during a really bad trip. Um, but anyway, we had one of those outposts um, in Midcoast, Maine. And uh, so there's a little bit of that history that comes into the story as well. Hunter Thompson used to fly into my town to get drugs. <laughs> Suppl supplied by the CIA. Do the agents that are retired in your town, do they know about the book? Did you tell them? Um, Did you, you know, let anyone know? A lot of them have died off. I mean, this is a lot of them came and then they're they're probably in their late 80s and, and 90s now. But their their kids know. <clears throat> and um, I think there's a lot of amusement about it. In fact, um, it, it turned into the number one bestseller in the state of Maine just last week. So anyway, Mainers are interested in it because they are, you know, it's always this wink, wink. Yeah, we knew they were here. That's fun. <laughs> I love it. So if the movie goes forward, do you think they're going to be shooting it in Maine? No, because they'll shoot it in Canada. I know how the, how, I know how Hollywood works. They 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 don't they don't shoot in the U.S. if they can you know help it because know, it's so much they get, cheaper. They get terrific breaks in other countries. Yeah. But, and Maine um, doesn't really do good tax breaks for film companies. Maybe you can get that changed. Yeah, we're trying. It's such a gorgeous <laughs> place. I mean, it's such. How much fun is it to write? Maine in in your books because you've written stuff from all over the world yeah all over the country but Maine just really is such a character it, it is and I think it's a character not just because of the beauty of the place because there are a lot of beautiful places in the country it's just the people you know the people in Maine were so protective of our cities we're so protective of our towns we're very proud of our towns everybody knows everybody else we know um, <laughs> you know who's having marital problems uh, so it's 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 a it's like a state it's one big neighborhood we have a million people but you can go to the local dump because a lot of us don't have trash pickup you can go to the local dump and there's your governor there's next to you throwing her trash away as well so um, yeah it's one big neighborhood also have a lot of writers in Maine. I we mean, have, Stephen King yes. is the big, you know, the, but there are all kinds of um, yeah. other authors who live in Maine. The Washington Post actually had a whole article about where are the art artists and writers, and they said Jessica Fletcher was not a fiction. <laughs> we have one of the most writer. Um, I think our state is maybe number three of writers per capita in the state. That's a lot. We have a ton in Nashville. Oh, we have a ton in Nashville of all different genres. They're trying, we have all the different organizations. We have uh, SCBWI for the YA, and we've got Sisters in Crime, and we've got, I mean, all the different ones. And they're trying to start an organization that would cover all the genres because there's so many authors. Yeah. yeah. It's crazy. We should give a plug, too, for the mystery, the big international mystery convention called BoucherCon, named after a critic named Anthony Boucher. Everybody wonders why is it called BoucherCon. He was the New York Times mystery critic for many years. It's meeting in Nashville next summer, right before Labor Day. So um, 
It's a great time to go. They get a good deal at one of the hotels or resorts. People come from all over. Um, a lot of British authors and other authors will fly in. You know, it's really fun. So, And also, it's a break from the heat, right? Although I can't promise that Nashville will be oh, no. any cooler than Phoenix in It'll the be end of August. Than Phoenix. You think so? Oh, for sure. It'll be, yeah, it'll be, you know. Probably has bugs. <laughs> there are bugs. There will be bugs. Anyway, I'm JT. He's one of the guests of honors at that, and so is Brad Thor, and I think, um, oh, what's his name? Anthony Horowitz is coming. I think Harlan oh. as well. Harlan, maybe. Yeah, I'm trying Harlan's to think. One of the guests. Yeah, so you get a chance to, you know, it's really a lot of fun to go to one. So since and they give away a lot of free books. <clears throat> yes, and it's, it is, it's like what 800 authors and 3,000 attendees. No, it's not quite that big. Quite I think big. I think I think I remember the first one I went to in San Diego was 1988 because I was still trying to decide whether I really wanted to own a bookstore, um, and I think there were 600. And what I remember most was that I got to have lunch with Elizabeth Peters, so I didn't really care about anything else that happened. Uh, but then it just kind of kept growing. It wasn't really very international, you know, back then. And then it, it kind of, you know, gets bigger and travels easier now. And so, well, not really, but, you know, people are more inclined to travel long distances, so it swelled up. But I think it was about 2,000. So, I mean, the hotels don't have an unlimited capacity. So it's Gaylord. It's like they tack on a whole nother hotel when you close your eyes. It's crazy how big that place is. I know. I I had to I took an extra night at the San Diego Voucher Con for reasons I won't go into. And so the hotel was sold out and I said, mm, and they said, Well, there's one right next door. They said you can, you know, register over there at the Hilton. Right next door was like two miles because you had to go all the way across the convention center or whatever it is in San Diego, you know. So um you do sometimes find that right next door or the alternate hotel is not all that you wish for. So what was the inspiration for you for writing about Jane Thorne? I actually saw a article uh, that was advertising for a CIA librarian. Oh, you mean at the CIA? Yeah. At oh, the CIA. okay. The all right. CIA had put up a job posting looking for a librarian. And I, I immediately sent it to my husband and I said, Jane Bond, CIA librarian. <laughs> And went, dang, that's actually a really good idea. But I couldn't use the bond because of the of the right. stuff. So I changed her last name to Thorne. And she became Jane Thorne, CIA librarian. And, and, you know, it was fine. It was working out really well. But something was missing. And then I finally realized, magic. She needs to have magic. It needs to be a fantasy world where it can be more proactive, where I can just create something out of whole cloth. And, and Plus, you don't have the CIA vetting your book either. Right. So <laughs> she's, you know, exactly. she's, it's she's all made up. Part of, um, it's the TCO, the Torrent Control Organization. Yeah. And, and they are, the Torrent is the, is the magical stream where all magic comes from. And they are in charge of the American version of it. And there are offices all over from different countries. Um, you know, Interpol has their own magical office and all the different organizations have their own magical office. And, and Jane is um, 23 and very sassy and just not what you would think of as a CIA agent, right? She's not sophisticated like Maggie. Even Maggie Younger is incredibly sophisticated, right? And Jane, Jane is not. Jane's a goofball. Well, maybe, but, you know, you had all the fun of, like, making up a universe, too, which I think, you know, you're writing about real Maine. Um, and, you know, um, JT is making up the whole world of Jane, Th Jane Thorne, CIA librarian. Uh, which I think is great. So you've had a partner, haven't you, working on these? I have. I've had two different co-writers, and now I have a third um, because I I have so many books that I'm trying to do under my JT name that I don't have time to. I mean, it takes me. How long does it take you to write a book? Oh, it's a whole year. Okay, so it, it's not something that we can just snap our fingers and the book appears. Um, so it takes it takes me, you know, several months at least. And I had a friend who um, was in Nashville, part of the Nashville writers group that I was in. And I thought it would be really fun to work with her. And, and I had co-written with Catherine Coulter. So I'd gotten a taste of how, what works and what doesn't work. 
Um, so I, <laughs> that's, <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> well, no, well, I, we've seen you here before, mm-hmm. but I couldn't relate the name. Yep. Yeah. I'm like, where else do I know it from besides your books? And right. This? Yeah. I wrote six books with Catherine and we wrote a big international thriller series. It was very fun. Very fun. So I learned what to do and what not to do and brought on my friend and uh, we created the world, created an outline. She gave me a draft. I edited the draft and turned it into a book. And she did one book. Then I had somebody else for three books. And now I've got a new co-writer who I don't know if she's going to let me use her name at all. She just wants to be off into the sunset and she's helping me finish up the series. And so, it's so which, cool. which would you think <clears throat> for both of you would be harder making up a world world building it's called um or or writing in a real world um and having to adapt it to your book you know you've always well you haven't always written I've never I've world. never made up a a world so but I don't you think the historical towns, ones though. are kind of like yeah, that I mean yeah, yeah you make up towns things like that but I'm um, I but doing it from scratch yeah. where reality is different I've never tried that it is so much fun um, these books are, there. it's a reverse dystopian. We start in the real world and by the end of the series, it's a magical world and the real world doesn't exist anymore. So it's, it's, things are going. Oh, wow, I wish you could really do that for 2024. Right? Wouldn't that be amazing? <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> I mean, fantasy is a lot of wish fulfillment. Oh, <laughs> it really right? is. It really is. So hilariously, the other day I got an email from a publisher saying that, I'm trying to remember, she's the retired director. Anyway, whatever she is at the CIA, if not number one, number two, has written a book and would like me to host um, an event for her. And did I know any ex-CIA people who would like to appear. And I started counting the number of writers I know who actually, not you two, but actually worked at the CIA. And I came up with seven. Um, So I wrote to two of them and they said, you know, they'd they'd like to do that. It would be fun. But this is nonfiction. So it'll be kind of interesting. That's really cool, though. Yeah, it really. But I just, I laughed because I knew both of you were going to be here. And I thought, wow, here's the universe is going to send me a real CIA person. (laughs) I love it. So I think we're ending up at the end of April because when her book comes out, there's way too much else going on and we couldn't fit it in. But I think it'll be, yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing that Zoom has provided a way to do things. I wouldn't want to have her here because if I had her here, we'd have security people. It would be, you know, all, I mean, I did the book launch for James Patterson and Bill Clinton together and Lee Child horned in, but that's another question. <laughs> but people have said to me, you know, how did you do that at the store? And I said, I would never have agreed to do it at the store because what you would have to go through with, you know, the presidential detail and all the rest of it, it, it just wouldn't be worth it. Zoom, you know, you can say, great, I'd love to talk to President Clinton, no problem. So we had a lot of fun on Zoom during the pandemic, you and I. We did. Actually, JT and Jane Ann Krentz and I and the rest of our staff, five of them, they did a whole series on the poison pen, why why it is the poison pen and how we work. And, you know, I've been meaning to get Patrick. We need to put it all together Mm -hmm. and, you know, string it up there so you could watch the whole thing because it's interesting. I intentionally have not listened to or watched what the other staff had to say (laughs) about the bookstore. I thought it would probably be better if I didn't actually know. There's one you don't want to (laughs) watch. Right. But I think it's a great, I thought it was a great idea you know, to try to find out how um, a bookstore works. I'm doing an, a Zoom event with the Global Chamber of Commerce tomorrow, and they sent me a list of, like, 11 questions, and and then they said, you have 10 minutes, and there'll be two authors with you, and I thought, these people are just not clued in. What in the world am I going to be able to do in 10 minutes, you know, to explain how anything, I mean, hopeless, but anyway, um, I'm trying to distill it down, and here's, here's you guys are are just a great example of it. The first thing an author should learn before they approach a bookstore is what is that bookstore's community? What is that bookstore's audience? And the two authors that are appearing with me are writing nonfiction. One's about finance, and I think, and one's about something else. So neither of them, <clears throat> excuse me, would I ever ask here because that's not that's not our audience. I wouldn't do you know political books or a I mean, basically, we're here to have fun. 
you know, that's why you're here, right? We're, we're occasionally I stray off into politics, but I try to just, you know. But basically, I want you to come here and feel safe and have a good time and talk to authors and go home with a book that'll be fun to read. And, you know, if an author doesn't do their homework first and wants to come, I have to, I'm sort of snippy about it. Put them through boot camp. Uh, no, I just say no. But I mean, my point is, <clears throat> my point is that if you were, if there's no other message I get across tomorrow, my point would be if you as an author want to work with a bookstore, your first job is to find out what kind of bookstore it actually is and who goes there. And because otherwise you'd, you'd be wasting everybody's time if, you know, if you all wanted to come down here to learn better management techniques, you know, um, and an AI startup or something, this is not your bookstore, right? And that's the wonderful thing about publishing is that hardly anybody actually knows anything. I just love it. It's you so have funny. no you idea. You all know that. that <laughs> no, yeah. It really is I mean, true. We're even, uh, do you, I'm sure you don't feel like this, but I often feel at a disadvantage. Like, I just don't even get how this business works. No, it, and the business keeps changing. I mean, it it's we just, we can't keep up with it sometimes and things that used to work no longer work anymore and everybody's trying something new. Some people are trying something new. A lot of the publishers are not trying at all. So um, I think that well, it's, You know, it's, the basic problem is you're trying to marry creativity with a business. Yeah. And I mean, you're, you're actually taking two things to, to a great extent are irreconcilable and, and making them somehow work is really what it comes down to. Uh, it's like an artist in a gallery, you know, that would be an analogy. When we had our little store over on Main Street, we first started, there was like 500 square feet. I don't know if any of you remember it. After a while, they put up the statue at Marshall Way in Maine, and then, because people couldn't find us, and then I could say, we're at the horse's ass. That made it <laughs> so much easier for people to find our store. So, um, it was, right, where was I going? <laughs> Remind me, I got carried away there. What was I talking about? Business and art. Business and art, yeah. How you get it, how, how creativity and oh, business don't okay, necessarily right. Sorry, mix. just a blank there. So next to us, we were in a string of four, and it was three art galleries and us. And, and on the corner, on our right-hand side, right at the horse's ass, actually, <laughs> was a gallery. And every single September somebody would come in and open a new gallery. It was an artist, and it would be a sculptor, or it would be a painter, or I don't know, macrame, whatever it was. And every year in June, they closed. And the reason was that if they were running a business, if they were actually running the art gallery, they didn't have any time to make art. So as soon as they sold out their inventory, whatever it was they had that they wanted to sell, they were there because they didn't want to pay the, a gallery commission and so forth. They thought, you know, I made it. I can keep all the money. If I come down here, how hard can it be? And what they overlooked was you can't actually run a business and make the art at the same time. So publishing kind of divides that up. You know, they try to run a business. You guys are making, you know, the art, so to speak. We are. And I mean, Tess, that's, you've had two lives. I mean, you were a doctor, yeah. you were a scientist, and you're rational, all of that. How do you make that leap over to the creative side and do it so successfully? Well, I was more, I was creative to begin with. I think um, I wanted to be a writer when I was seven. Did you? Yeah, and I was I was directed away from writing because my dad say said it was no way to make a living, so <laughs> I ended Thanks, up in dad. medicine instead. Um, but you know, I think once you you feel like you're a storyteller, it never goes away, and that's really I went back to it after my children were born, and I went on maternity leave. It was a great time to write a book, with two sleeping babies, um, and that's that's how I ended up back into it. But it was like I never left it; it was always there. I mean, and you, you were working at, but as a, in the White House, weren't you? Yeah, I, I was a glorified tea maker. <laughs> I was a so very you, young glorified tea maker. <laughs> I mean, you had an interesting job before you became a writer. Yeah, but I was also a writer when I was a kid. See? And all the way through, and it was my senior thesis advisor in college when I went to ask for my MFA mm -hmm. uh, recommendation to apply. I needed a letter. And she said, you're not good enough to be published and wouldn't give me a letter. <gasps> Oh, you know, there are so many sources of discouragement in this in this profession, uh, whether it's your dad saying, no, there's no way to make a living and somebody saying you're not a good enough writer. And then and, and we work hard. We spend a whole year or five years or 10 years writing a book. And then then we get readers who say, meh, 
you know, you, that's so. There's 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 a, there's discouragement every step every of the step. way. So much rejection, yeah. so much negativity, but you have to do what you love. Yeah, and and make it fun. I mean, that's you've hopped around in genres. You've done a yeah. bunch of different things because it's fun. And we do it because we love it. Because um, if you don't love it, then what are you doing? <laughs> no, you have no business doing this. You, and then you never, come here for lots of love, right? We right. have so much right. love here. That's you why, we that's why you're here. Country. I know. Love. It's wonderful. How about if we ask questions from the audience? Yeah. What do you think? Would that be a good idea? Here's Christina, who is about to join us as an author because her book debuts on March 25th oh, right here at the Poison Pen. And she has an interesting job, too, because she works for NPR. The local NPR, nonetheless. And she's our informal events photographer, too. I know. I love she it. She everything. <laughs> she does. She's a really versatile person. So what's your question? I think I'm just more in tune with what what I'm actually doing. You know, when you start off, you just kind of just do it and you don't really think about what you're doing. But now I think I'm more aware of of what my technique is. And I think what my technique is, is really getting deep and feeling the emotional aspects of every single scene and knowing that it's emotions that pushes forward into the story that I don't need action. I don't need gunplay. I don't need car chases. What I really need are two people or three people who feel something deeply and are at odds with each other. Um, and that is really what, what my stories are, I think are, are really all about now is, um, uh, is just trying to figure out what everybody wants and what everybody needs in the story. I've also, I think, veered away a lot from the feeling that I need to have murder on every page. Uh, you know, when you start off as a mystery writer, you think, oh, whenever something gets dull, you just kill another person. Um, that, that to me, it turns out, I don't think is, is really what pulls me forward. And I, I come back to this James Bond movie I was watching. I can't remember which one it was, but there were chases and car ch you know, cars, cars screeching. And I would get bored during those action scenes. But I was riveted by a scene where James and a young woman are talking on the train. And that dialogue was what made me, f you know, bent forward. And I thought, now I'm engaged. I didn't care about the action. I cared about what these two people were saying, both, you know, overtly and uh, the real text underneath that. Um, so I think that's that's what I've, I've learned as, as time goes by, is that it's really about relationships and emotions. Casino Royale. Yeah, yeah, that must have been it. <laughs> and he asks, she asks, how was the lamb? And he says, skewered. One sympathizes. It's like, oh my gosh. <laughs> You're right. You're absolutely right. Yeah. I mean, it's vital. Right. And I, I fist fights are boring. I don't, I mean, maybe men like them, but I, I'm bored. So when you do your draft, is it like, draft of the whole book or just it is a draft of the whole book i think the only thing that's peculiar about me is that i write my first drafts with pen and paper uh, <laughs> I, I i don't know but it's not peculiar i think that's just interesting <laughs> that, that's harder. a nice way of saying it <laughs> it's, that feels harder to me though i have broken down you know when something's not working yeah you get out the notebook right, right. and i the reason is when I see my words on a screen, I want to edit and it turns on a different part of my brain that gets in the way of telling the story. So, um, and I have, I have doctor handwriting. So when, <laughs> when I write, it's not so easy to see the mistakes because the writing is so, the handwriting is so awful and I can, I can get that forward motion going. And I'm also, I think it has to do with the way we learn to write as children that the, our first thing is, is holding a pencil and holding a pen with a piece of paper and it gets back to, childhood play and that's that it just makes it easier for me so did you go back to that teacher and say ha ha i can write um <laughs> when my first book came out i did look her up to, <laughs> to i was gonna send her a copy she never got tenure uh, 
Uh, Wait. Uh, I didn't need to do a thing. Karma took care of it. That, yeah. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. I started the book last night, and I'm already hooked. The characters are wonderful. I really like the book club. Not to that point yet. I just met Danny. Um, but the, the two women are wonderful, and that's who you're continuing with, Joe and Meg. Yes. So my question is, um, if you're talking with Prime Amazon, this oh, oh Amazon Studios. Amazon Studios. So how long does it take from that discussion to actually see? Forever. Well, you know they. <laughs> Long I, enough to finish the series. Yes, I, I signed the deal back in April, I think. But then we had the writer's strike and then we had the Actors Guild strike. So I think everything went on hold. Um, and I, I have no idea. They just wanted to, to meet with me. Um, so I'll see how, you know, what the forward motion is. I think they're, I've heard that they're already talking about talent. So that's a good, that's a good thing. How hard is it when, because uh, obviously Rizzoli and Isles happened while you were still writing the series. You weren't done with those characters. How hard is it to then turn over? I'm thinking also of George R. R. Martin, you know, anybody who, uh, Rebecca Yaros just yeah. sold her series and that's not done yet. How do you, how do you reconcile well, your idea with theirs? I think Rizzoli and Isles was easier because they made they they made up their own stories. You know, every every week was a different story, and it didn't have to be based on the books. A little bit like Kathy Rice. I mean, she I was just going to yeah. say Bones was like that for for Kathy. The other thing is, um, I did a recent interview with the Wall Street Journal, and one of the questions that came up was about books and television. Um, and my experience is that good television can sell lots and lots of books because people who don't read or don't read that book see the television or see the movie and are then attracted to the books. But my other experience is that bad television and bad movies don't actually hurt the author or hurt the book. It's still the book, you know. Um, and so, you know, you readers might go, God, that was just terrible adaptation or whatever it is. But that doesn't mean you didn't still love the book. I've just been reading Nicola Upson's new book. It's about Rebecca, about Alfred Hitchcock making Rebecca with David O. Selznick, which apparently was just like a nightmare scenario all the way around. And um, they don't have to, you know, actually follow the book. So one of the big questions was, you know, in it is how true to Rebecca Will it be? And because the Hayes office, which was a big censorship office in the 1940s and 50s, I think, you know, today, as far as I can tell, there's no censor anywhere, but back then it was a big deal, would not let them stay true to the book when Max kills Rebecca, shoots her, and they were not going to approve a murder because then there had to be consequences and Mac gets away, you know, doesn't pay for it. I mean, and so they, and just... so, well, I know it, but they had to be like legal consequences. Yeah. I need it's to a, read this book. It's really fascinating. And so the whole question was, how could they stay semi true to the book and get by the Hayes office? And Nobody ever wanted to talk to Daphne. You know, she was not a part of the whole discussion ever about what they were going to do with this pivotal point of the book. Um, and, and you have to keep that in, in mind. You know, when Ann Cleves was here, she was happy to say she stopped writing Shetland after seven books, I think. No, I don't remember how many books. Shetland had seven seasons. And then I think it might have been season five when they stopped doing the books and went on and wrote their own. And then the guy starring in Shetland decided to quit. So the last Shetland had a really, you know, it never works when they want to just get rid of, you know, and I mean, they kill people badly or, you know, whatever stupid thing it is. But then she announced when she was here on Labor Day that they were starting up Shetland again and they were bringing in a woman to take the place of Jimmy. And also, this is the universe she created and all, but now it's gone way past her. And it's not even going to have the hero. It's going to have some completely new person, you know. Um, yeah. I mean, unless you have a series that's like long running, 25 books, we just can't write fast enough for television. Um, so that I think a lot of these shows, they just they just bring in their own team of writers. They come up with their own plots. It's really interesting. Yeah. I mean, I you know lived through the entire Outlander thing, as you might imagine. And season eight, the last season, is about to start filming. Well, she's still writing, 
but this, the TV as we know it is going to come to an end. Well, there's not going to be somebody else playing Jamie or Claire, right? It's just not going to happen. Nobody would accept that. So this is one where the author's going on, but the, but the TV quits, as opposed to Anne, where the TV is going on, but the author quit. Well, I just can't see it without Jimmy Paris. I just don't. <laughs> it's really hard to see it without that character. Did you watch the last episode? Yeah. Did, didn't you think it was really cheesy the way? I mean, I thought it was terrible. <laughs> Had to get rid of him. I know. <laughs> well, there we go. Right. And he, you know what? I hate to say this, but that actor is a quitter. He has quit several series. I, well, but he'd been in it for a long time. I know. You know, and I think that gets boring. Patrick, do you have a question from the audience since you're wandering over here with your phone? Okay. Um, we have an international case. Tony from Romania. He's tuning in again. Tony, you're back. <laughs> And Stefania, you're still up too late, Stefania. I know what time it is in your So Tony says hello from Romania. This is awesome. I have thirty four of her books. and he asks, Who are some of your favorite authors? Well, okay, there's one sitting right here. <laughs> you know, um, I, I love, I, um, whenever somebody asks that, I, I seem to always fall back on the Lisas. I love Lisa Gardner. Yeah, all the She'll Lisas. Be here March 12th gives me a chance to tell you, oh, right? Okay, okay. Yay, yay, Mar Lisa Gardner. Lisa Scottolini? March 25th. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, there you go. Lisa Unger, date uncertain, but and March. Lisa Unger, so right. all three Lisas will be here in March. So there's nothing about Lisas. I don't know. I just, I just love their books. We have some uh, casting choices for Maggie. Uh -huh. Good. Who? And somebody said Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> I'm seen. I'm way too senior. <laughs> I uh, never could do that. She would chew up and spit out. Uh, let's see. Um, Renee asks. And Forgive me if you've already addressed this. Uh, is Maggie's neighbor still living there with his grandmother? Yes, they're in the, they're next door in the second book still. This may be too personal, JT, but where are you currently living? Nashville. Nashville. Anybody else have a question? Don't talk the spotlight here. Um, yeah, so Margo just has a question, Tess, about, um, you know, she says that a lot of people have told her that she should write. How did you first decide, or when did you first decide to become a writer, seriously? You, uh, have, you have a you know, distinguished career before this. <laughs> Yeah, I started writing, um, as I said, when my kids were, were, uh, were infants and they were sleeping, and I wrote my first romance novel back then. I mean, I wrote, I wrote uh, two unpublished books, and then I sold the third. So I think the way to do it is just to start doing it, and never, never stopped. My, my own rule is I don't stop to rewrite in the middle of the first draft, because if I stop to edit... I will never get beyond that chapter. I just feel like I will just edit the first three chapters to death, and then I'll get bored, and then I'll move on to something else. So um, I think it's important to keep on writing that first draft, no matter how flawed, and to give yourself permission to write badly. What's your favorite part of the process? Do you like the, the first draft, just getting the story out there, or do you like going back in and shaping it? Oh, I love that first impulse you know i love it when it's first born and the idea comes to you and you just think oh i can do so much with this and i can remember pretty much the moment that each book was conceived um you know oh when your brain explodes you think oh this is a book now you don't know what that book is going to turn out like but you just know this idea is a book oh hello mark mark will be here february 20th <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Mark. The dates. That's amazing. <laughs> Barbara remembers everything. I could, I could do this all the way up through June. <laughs> we have two more. Oh, three more questions. Three more first. I was just question. Um, Ted. Mm -hmm. The characters in the TV show were so in Isles were so different than the books. Yeah. But did you enjoy it? I, you know what I thought they did really well was the humor. They added so much humor to those because my books are kind of dark. Yeah. 
Um, and they made they made the whole show funny and amusing, and I think that's what gave it such success. Um, they didn't. You're right. They didn't look like my characters at all. Um, if you know Jane Rizzoli, she's not a very good-looking woman in the books. She's a very ordinary woman, and now she's played by Angie Harmon, <laughs> who d who does a great job. Um, and it's not her fault that she's a goddess, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> but it was it was not no it was not the way I envisioned them. So. You know, I have been going through lists, and I was thinking that actually Jamie Lee Curtis would make a good Maggie. Um, and you know who else I love? I love Kristen Scott Thomas. Um, but I think that they're they're busy, <laughs> so I don't know who else is available. You see my face going, uh huh. <laughs> totally see that. And you know, um, there's a uh, the male character. Um, Declan, who is uh, kind of loved Maggie from afar for all these years. I was thinking Gabriel Byrne when I was writing him, uh, and I just found out he lives in Maine. <laughs> that would be perfect. Oh my gosh. There was one more plans to write some more Rizzoli and Isles books? Um, I'm not sure because I'm having so much fun with this particular series. I mean, I had another idea for, for number 14 in Rizzoli and Isles, um, but I'm not sure when I'll go back to it. Well, anybody else online? Or you guys have sat patiently in your chairs now, which is really hard to do on these unpadded chairs for oh. an hour and five minutes, so even longer if you came early. So thank you. Thank you very much. And JT, there is a book behind my water bottle. And this is the moment where I like to thank you all by giving you a free book. And this is an actual book, not an advanced reading copy, which is what I normally give you. It's a book that came out last year called Winterland, which I absolutely loved. And it is set... Um, <sighs> I don't even know how I can, it's set in Siberia and it is about um, a camp that Russia set up for athletes training. And this is a young woman who was part of a gymnast team and wanted to break away from it. Um, it's, it's just, it's a debut, uh, it was one of our book club picks last year. Meadows vaults us into the chilling and eerily relevant today world of Soviet era gymnastics. Get ready to fall in love with eight year old Anya, who offers us a heart wrenching view of what it means to live, love, and compete in a sport where one wrong move or the whisper of dissent can ruin you. And even worse, it's in Siberia. So, John, are we at 16, 17? Okay, thank you. Uh, Tess, pick a number between 1 and 16, if you will, and I will give that person this copy of Winterland. Four? Ah, a winner! Wonderful! I hope you enjoy it. I thought it was a wonderful book. That sounds like a really cool book. It's a very <laughs> cool book. How many uh, more copies so. do you have? I have enough to okay. give you one if you'd like one, right? I'll buy it, girl. Well, right, so... Okay. No, 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 no. Um, actually, what happened is we got a shipment, and some of them, although were damaged, and the publisher, it's too expensive now to return them, so the publisher said, just keep them. And I don't feel comfortable selling books that we then got for free, so I like to give them away. So that's what, so I'll be happy to give you each one. You take it home. And I don't right. care if it's damaged. <laughs> so, Not me neither. Right. So thank you all again. And I think that we'll just let our authors sit here at this table, which is at photographing height, and you could line up by number. If you could fold up your chair and lean them against that wall. If you lean them against this wall, they slide off and hurt. Um, and have a safe drive home. Thanks again. Thank you all.